Hey, I'm in a series called The Miracles of Jesus, The Healing Miracles of Jesus. There are 26 of those, and so they're fascinating to me to study, and I want to take you to a journey with uh, the miracle of Jesus healing the woman with the issue of blood. But before we get to that in Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse number 18, I want to read at the end of the chapter here. It says that Jesus, in verse 35 of Matthew chapter 9, he said, He went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Notice that phrase there, every sickness and every disease among the people. I think that's interesting how it, it phrases that. He says in verse number 36, he says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He still is. It says he, he saw people weary and scattered like sheep with no, having no shepherd. Then verse 37, he said to the disciples and those following, he said, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the labors are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send out labors into his harvest. If you'll notice verse number 35, there are three things about Jesus' ministry that we always need to bear in mind that have never stopped and will are a part of the ministry today of who we are as far as Metroplex Family Church, as far as the body of Christ, as far as all of us. He was doing three things. He was teaching. It says teaching in their synagogues or in the local churches, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, of course, him being the king of the kingdom. And then, and again, at the end of verse number 35, it says he was healing every sickness and every disease among the people. In Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 18, there's a, I'm going to read all three, trans, uh, three ver, excuse me, three accounts in the gospel, so bear with me. But this is the woman with the issue of blood. And uh, just bear with me as I read this because... Um, I'm actually going to read from my book that I've written, but at the same time, I want you to see some things that, that has taken me nearly three years to put together, and I want to share with you here in a couple of minutes. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse number 18. Uh, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. Matthew 9, 18. Notice what it says. While he spoke these things, there behold a ruler and worshipped, notice this, a ruler came and worshipped Jesus, saying, my daughter has just died. And you, will you come and lay your hand on her and she will live? So here's this setting here, beginning in verse number 18. And then it says in verse 19, Then Jesus arose and followed him and his disciples with him. So here they go. And then suddenly, in verse 20, it says, A woman with a flow of blood or an issue of blood, and we're going to describe all this in just a minute, for 12 years came behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, now notice this phrase, if I only may touch his garment, I shall be well. Verse number 22, and then Jesus turned around and, he, and, he, and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that very hour. So if we'll go to uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 25 through 34, Mark 5. Mark, Mark does a better job as far... Well, let me say it like this. Each, each writer of the Gospels has his own, way, his, own, his own way of saying it. But in Mark chapter 5, there's more detail to this story that brings up the points I just want to share with you for a couple of minutes in this service. Mark chapter 5, verse 25. Notice what it says. Mark 25 says this. And a certain woman who had a flow of blood, or again, an issue of blood, for 12 years. Now notice this is a long time. This woman is dealing with this and we're going to get that in just a second and has suffered many things and, and from many physicians and she had spent all that she had and, and was no better, but rather grew worse. So Mark is being very descriptive here and what he's saying about this issue with this woman. In verse number 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment for she said, if I only may touch his clothes, I will be well. So Jesus, she was thinking or saying to herself, she wasn't answering asking Jesus to actually minister to her. She was just saying, if I could just touch him, I will be healed or made whole. In verse number 25, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction of that very moment. Isn't that powerful? And then Jesus said in verse 30, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him. So this woman actually pulls on the power and the anointing of the Lord. And then he says again, what he says in verse number 30, he says, who touched my clothes. But the disciples said to him, you see the multitude around you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done this thing. In verse 33, the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came before him and told the whole truth. And look what Jesus says in verse 34. He has not changed. He is still the most beautiful man that has ever walked this earth. Look at these words. He called her daughter. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And then finally, in the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 8, this same version, 
Uh, and by the way, the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing this, that not all the miracles of Jesus are recorded in all three versions. Some, some only are captured in one version. Why the writers or why the Holy Spirit did that, I do not know. But in this case, this woman is captured in all three. And in Luke chapter 8, verse 43, listen to this. Same story, but listen to this version. Luke chapter 8, verse 43. It said, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those around him said, Master, the multitudes are throng and press you, and you say, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody touched for me, touch me, excuse me, for I perceive power flowing out of my or flow going out of me. And verse 47, when the woman saw this, she was she was not hidden. She came trembling and falling down before him, and declared to him in the presence of all the people, the reason she had been touched by him, the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Everybody say immediately, please. Uh, immediately. One more time. Uh, immediately. So something happened supernaturally once she touched him. Verse number 48, it says, he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So look at this in some, some interesting things. First of all, we see the leader of the synagogue. All right, he's, he's coming before Jesus. And it says in the first version, it says he worshiped Jesus. I mean, his daughter just died, and now he's worshiping Jesus. What faith is that, in my opinion, of demonstration? That your daughter had just died, and yet you're going to come worshiping Jesus and, of course, asking him to come minister and um, go minister to your daughter. So as Jesus is following this man, then all of a sudden this woman dealing with this blood issue, and we've got to remember something about a blood issue back then. This is a very, what is called, unclean. And so she is dealing with a severe public issue. As a matter of fact, people in that time when the woman had this kind of situation going on, they would cry out, unclean, unclean. And so she is pressing through this crowd, and she, after 12 years of dealing with this, which is a long time, she reaches out to Jesus with what one minister calls divine audacity. I mean, she shunned the crowd. She shunned all the things that were coming against her. And she reaches out to him. And I, I like what some people call it. They, she reached out to him for the touch of, with a touch of faith. She wasn't just desperate, but she reached out to him with him knowing that if I just put my hand in some form of connection with him, I am going to be transformed. What a beautiful thing. There was something different about this woman, and it's something different for you and I today. The desperation in this woman is something I think that believers lose today. We, we get our salvation, we receive the Lord, and we just sort of live life. And, you know, again, I'm not saying being desperate to the point where well, I don't know. I don't know nothing wrong with being desperate, you know, when it comes to the Lord. I mean, you want what he has to offer you. You want who he is. And this determination got Jesus' attention, and he stopped this whole situation, turns around and ministers to her, even though this leader is wanting him to go raise his daughter from the dead. I think this is boldness beyond boldness, in my opinion. There are four interesting things about this woman who suffered this embarrassing and humiliating blood flow for 12 years. I mean, this was a long time. We don't don't know her age. I mean, she could have been 12 years old. She could have been 24. We don't know, but we know that it was a humiliating thing. We know that it was embarrassing. They probably didn't have the things that ladies have today concerning these things. There was no relief. She had been to physician after physician, and then she was labeled unclean. She was mocked. She was ridiculed. She was made up fun of. She couldn't go in public. She was scorned in public. And yet at the same time, this woman not only reaches the Lord and gets healed, but there's a powerful thing about this whole thing. Jesus is the only time in the Gospels he calls this woman daughter. Isn't that so beautiful of him? He called her daughter. Isn't that awesome? I think that's one of the most beautiful things about him. Not only does he stop everything, not only is she healed, not only does he perceive what she did, and how she did it, he turns around and we'll read it again. He called her daughter. I think that's beautiful. Number two, there's in, in two of the Gospels, he's tell, she's told to be of good cheer, which means go be bold and courageous. I know it, we, don't, you know we don't use that language today, go be of good cheer. But actually it's translated be bold, be bold and courageous. In two of the Gospels, it says this, it says to go in peace, which means to be free from the anxiety and the worry. 
Oh my goodness, 12 years. Everybody say 12 years. 12 years is a long time, ladies and gentlemen. Some of us can't deal with something for 120 days. This lady dealt with something for 12 years. And it says that he, and it says at the end there, he says for her to go in peace and that which means to be free of the anxiety. Let me read it again as it says here in Matthew chapter 9. Let me get to it real quick. I'm in Luke and let me get back to Matthew chapter 9. And notice what it says here. I, I like what Jesus said here at the end. Let me read it to you one more time. In Matthew chapter 9, it says right here in Matthew chapter 9, uh, in verse number, um, notice what it says here in verse number, um, oh my goodness, yeah, hold on, verse number, goodness, where is it? <laughs> so, uh, my Lord. Jesus, and it, it, oh yeah, verse 22, verse 22, it says, And Jesus turned around and said to her, Be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you whole. And the woman was made from the, well from that hour. Of course, good cheer, you know, it's, it, it can be translated a lot of different ways. But to me, it says, Go be bold, be in peace, be free from this anxiety. Your faith has made you whole. And the woman was made whole that very same hour. So there's some things here that I want to share with you. First of all, number one, the determination to be healed sets the atmosphere for healing, in my opinion. If you want a supernatural encounter with God, you've got to be determined. Maybe it's not healing in your body. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something in the mind. Maybe it's something in a financial need. Whatever the situation may be, there has to be a level of determination. There has to be a level of audacity to say that, God, I'm going to believe you for this regardless of how I feel, regardless of what's going on. I'm determined to sit, set an atmosphere in my life that I'm going to receive from God. So many times people pray, unfortunately, and they, they, in their prayers, they're actually mad with God. They blame God for the situation or, or get into a place where they keep rehearsing the problem. No, you get to a place where, you know what, I'm believing you, Lord. I'm determined that I'm going to see healing in this situation whether it's in my body, whether it's in my mind, whatever the situation is, I am determined to get into your presence. Number two, a point of contact with faith causes the supernatural to happen. What do you mean by a point of contact? It's just that this woman reached out. Remember what she said? Clearly in the, in the verses there, she said, uh, verse number 20, the woman said, for if I, she said in verse 21, she said, she said this, if I only may touch his garment, I may be well. So she was releasing her face. She was saying, Lord, if I could just touch your garment, I'm going to be made whole. And again, we're not physically reaching out to Jesus right now. I mean, there's no physical contact with him, but there is the spirit of the living God. There is an atmosphere of faith that you can create with the touch of faith, with your words, with your attitude, with your humility. And again, it's not begging God, it's just saying, I, I just, Lord, I come before you with humility. First of all, if there's anything in my life that's not of you, then please show me how I can connect myself better to you. Thank God for your mercy and your grace and your goodness. But what can I do to have this point of contact? Sometimes to me, the point of contact is communion. I am a big communion person. What do you mean by that, Pastor Brian? It means that I go before the Lord and I lay out the scripture, yes, but I take the elements and I do one of the most important things we can do as a believer. Not ask, not beg, not complain, but turn to him and say, I just want to thank you for who you are that you have not changed, that you love this woman and you stopped in the middle of all this commotion to reach out to this precious woman who had dealt with an issue for 12 years. And I know that what I'm dealing with these last 12 days is nothing like that, but I just want to thank you. Or even what I'm dealing with over this last 12 hours, I am putting my faith in you. And as a point of contact with Thanksgiving, I am receiving communion. I am receiving your presence. Again, that's what coming to this building is all about. Church attendance is not necessarily just for, you know, the attendance where we see each other. It's also a place and a point of contact. Sometimes you just need to come separate yourself. Maybe it's something that I say. Maybe it's something that I don't say. Maybe you're in this atmosphere that where you steal your mind and your body for an hour or so, and you can hear from God that you can take your phone out or your iPad and you can write something down that has nothing to do with what I'm saying or even one of the worship songs that we're saying. It may be just a word from God that you need to do this or do that. That's why, yes, you can watch at home and yes, you can be at home, but usually when we try to watch something, we're what? We're distracted, right? Let's just be sincere about it. In this atmosphere, you separate yourself. 
That fourth song we sang, all the songs were good today. They're always worshipful songs in my opinion, whether it's one version or not. I appreciate what we have here. But sometimes it's not just the music. Sometimes it's not the sound. It's the attitude. Jonathan Moore is not a performer's performer. He's not a showman. He comes up here with a sincere heart, and so does Michelle. And I mean, every one of these, every one of these people, everyone today, Shelby, everybody, every single one of them. And of course, my daughter, Allison. <laughs> no, seriously, all of them, seriously. There's no worshiping up here as far as themselves and performance base. I've been to a lot of churches. I've seen performance base. I'm a musician. I see when musicians are performing. And there's nothing wrong with that because it's your talent and all right, you want to do your best to God. But when you've got somebody worshiping the Lord and their eyes are not what on the people are responding and reacting, notice a true worshiper, they just got their eyes on the, the heavens. And that's what's happening here. And there's creating that atmosphere. And when you create that atmosphere, that's a point of contact. That's also a point of contact when you honor the Lord with your giving and whatever the situation is, it may be giving to support the ministry of the church or just giving to someone else. It's a point of contact beyond yourself, ladies and gentlemen. And these things not just get the attention of the Lord, but bring you into a place of connection with him. Anyway, I just want to ask you, you know, are you willing to press through by faith regardless of all the situations that are you're dealing with? Like this woman, sometimes you got to press through. Just think of that woman. I imagine before she touched Jesus' garment, people said some ugly things about her. Probably did. Why are you up here? How, why are you in this street crowd? What are you doing here, lady? You know, you need to be away from us. You're unclean. And yet she pressed through. She grabbed his garment. And look what Jesus did. He stopped this whole thing and turned to her and called her daughter and said, be of good cheer. You be bold. You be full of the peace of God. You go free from this worry. You're my daughter and you are healed. Isn't that beautiful? I think he's the most amazing person that's ever walked this earth. And he is alive today and he's alive to you and I. Hey, I just want to bring that into your, into your something to think about. The next miracle is in the same chapter and this is different to me. It's the two blind men. Check this out. There's only one time this was recorded in the gospels. It's in Matthew chapter nine, verse number 27. Listen to this. I think it's sort of comical. Uh, and when the two, when verse number 27, Matthew chapter nine, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him. Now just stop and think about that. Two blind men followed Jesus. I, I, I'm, I'm from Talladega, Alabama, okay? We have a racetrack there, but we also have a blind and deaf school. I've grown up all my life watching blind people walk around the city of Talladega and they're being trained with dogs. They're being trained with their sticks. We see them. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. You see them constantly. And, and they have to learn how to do it. And some of them get very proficient at being able to, to, to walk with a stick and perceive and use sound. But anyway, it says these two blind men follow Jesus crying out. Do you realize how hard that is if you're blind? It says in verse number 27, when Jesus departed, there two blind followed him saying, son of David, have mercy on us. And when they'd come into the house, many people think that's Jesus' house. The blind men came to him. They just, they just went into his house. And, and this is what Jesus said. I mean, I think it's funny. Jesus says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Well, duh, <laughs> we're following you around. I mean, you know, we're running into stuff, running over people. I mean, we tried to get into this house. Can you imagine these two blind men, the audacity of these guys? I mean, they didn't knock on the door. They just went into Jesus' house. <laughs> I love these guys. I can't wait to meet them. Anyway, we're going to call them Fred and, and Bill, all right? <laughs> so anyway, do you, believe, do you believe I'm able to do this? And Fred and Bill said, yes, Lord, duh. <laughs> you know, so anyway, and then look what Jesus said. He touched their eyes saying, according to your my power. No, what Jesus say? What did he say? Come on, now learn something with me. According to your what? Faith. Your faith. You're believing me. Your absolute audacity to follow me around, come into this house where I am, bar barge in here, and let me turn the question around and ask you this question. And Jesus says, according to your faith, according to you believing in me, let it be done. And it says in verse 30, it says, their eyes were open and Jesus sternly warned them saying, see that no one knows this. And when they had departed, they spread the news about him all the country. Why did Jesus say that? Of course, first of all, he's dealing with all these religious people. But can you imagine two people that were blind 
oh my gosh, when they got their vision and they were restored. I saw this baby the other day. It was so cute. She was on YouTube, and um, I like YouTube for some things. Anyway, she, uh, she, could, she had trouble with her eyes, and they put these specialized glasses they'd made for her. And it was a new experimental type of glasses on this child. Anyway, um, and she could see partially, but not clearly, okay? She had vision, but not full vision. And I'm talking about a little baby girl, maybe two years at the most. And she was so sweet with her little hair and everything. And they put those specialized glasses on there, clipped them back. And she looked at her mother, and she had the most beautiful smile. I mean, you just, you just had to stop and just, just take the moment in, the beauty of that. And you can you imagine these two blind men when they were seeing, and Jesus is telling them, don't tell anybody? <laughs> oh my gosh. Ladies and gentlemen, I think this is hilarious. I think Jesus is not only funny, but he is so compassionate with people. But if you'll notice something about these people that were with Jesus, these two blind men, Phil and, uh, Bill and Fred, and of course this lady, the woman with the issue of blood, we'll just call her name Elizabeth. Okay, or something like that. Listen, by the way, when we get to heaven, I'm going to need some name tags. I want to tell you something. There are people in the Bible, I can't pronounce some of those names up there. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm practicing that for when we get to heaven 100 years from now. I mean, some people have got some long names, do they not? Have you ever seen some of the names of people? I mean, I have trouble with, I, I'm pretty good with names right now, but when we get to heaven, I mean, anyway, moving right along. So anyway, notice what it says here about these guys. It says, these guys cried out, son of David, have mercy upon us. What were they were meaning by that? They were acknowledged that Jesus was who he was. Even all the Pharisees and all the Sadducees said that Jesus was not Lord and Savior. These two men were saying, son of David, the lineage of David that is born through you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that's who we're following. We may not can see you. We don't even know where you're going. We are going to plow our way through this situation. And we, we heard about what you did with the woman with the issue of blood. And you know what? We're going to do the same thing. We're going to get our healing. We're going to believe you and we are not going to take no for an answer. God has manifest himself on the earth. Jesus Christ is here. The Savior is here. And I'm not going to be blind no more. And these men just kept on till they got it. And so many times, you know, in our own lives, do we press towards the Lord that hard? Do we seek after him with that kind of intensity and compassion? I mean, I prayed with some people and if it didn't happen right then, they just give up and quit. You know, where's your faith? You know, even a football game's four quarters. Sometimes it starts out pretty bad until the end. You get the turnaround and maybe you can win the game at the end. But sometimes the first three quarters all the way to the fourth quarter are bad. Sometimes in life it's hitting you hard. But these men heard of Psalm 136 verse 1. They never read it because they couldn't see. But Psalm 136 1 says this, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Many times when we're going through things, I, that's the only thing that I can. I'm not giving thanks for the things that Satan is doing towards me and around me. I'm not giving thanks for him at all. But I'm giving thanks that the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good regardless of what's happening, regardless of what I'm feeling, regardless of anything that's taking place. And his mercy endures forever. Everybody say, thank God for the mercy of God. Thank God for his mercy. His mercy got you here today. His mercy will take you where you need to be. His mercy will be with you. And when you declare the goodness of God, the goodness of God is greater than the works of the enemy. Is it not? I mean, really, we got to think about how great he is and how good he is. And these two points of faith I want to share with you as we begin to close. Number one, great boldness and believing gets great results. Believing that God is who he is. Who he is, and he cannot fail. Going back to the communion table, many times I have just gone to the communion table and said, Lord, I just want to thank you for who you are in my life. I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know the way this is going to happen, and I sure don't know when it's going to happen, but I know that you are good. I know that I can trust you. I know that I can depend on you, and I give this to you. Number two, faith that they demonstrates a no-quit attitude in receiving for God, no matter the difficulty. Sometimes it's not easy to believe for something. It's not easy to believe for healing. And when you're feeling sick and you're taking medicine, you're thinking, why, why am I, when is my healing going to come? When is it going to manifest? When am I going to get stronger and better? I've been there and done that. I've had to press through to get to this place of health that I have right now. It wasn't easy, but I have it now. 
I was determined. Many times I had to say no to things that I did not want to do. For example, walking 10,000 steps a day, drinking so much amount of water and taking vitamins and doing this and <clears throat> refusing that. I mean, you know, there's certain foods I like just like anybody else, but sometimes you just got to come to a place and say no, you know? And there's always that thing that Satan, I don't know, he doesn't know this to you at all, but he called, uh, there's this new thing in the last two years, it's called comfort food. And I need comfort food. Don't even raise your hands, okay? You know, what's comfort food? Well, I'll go ahead and tell you what my comfort food is. I like those little bitty plain Sundays from McDonald's, okay? They're $2.15 and so you can get them at the drive through window real easy and real quick, okay? And every time I go through the McDonald's, when I'm feeling in need of encouragement, there's a voice that comes through that sign that says, Come, come, feel good. Let that, let that Sunday come through you because it's a Sunday. And what Sunday is the day that the Lord has made. And a Sunday is good for you. And you'll feel better after that Sunday. And the other day I was driving by and it's almost like the other, I caught myself the other day. I'm going down 35 and I just automatically went through there. And before I know it, the lady said, how can I help you? I was like, man. I can't, I can't, I've, I've had one of these four days in a row now, four days in a row. And I'm looking behind to make sure that nobody from the church is seeing me order my Sunday. It's almost like I'm, I've ordered alcohol or something, you know, put it in a brown bag and I'll put it under. <laughs> so, I mean, I felt like it was sinful. Anyway, and I grab my Sunday and I pull over and I think this is ridiculous. I am pulling over in a parking lot, eating this all by myself. I'm not addicted to anything or nobody. Now I'm not going to do this, but I enjoyed them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but it comes to a place where what do you got to do in life? Sometimes you need help. You need that crutch of support. Maybe, maybe you don't have the problem I have with Sundays from McDonald's. But my point is, listen, I'm determined to not let anything more be more important in, than the Lord. I love what this lady said the other day on this video. I've discovered TikTok, and I'm, some of that stuff on there is sort of weird. I'm, trying to, I was, I'm looking for a channel that has you know, funny videos. I like to see cats and dogs doing stuff. You know, there's some stuff on there. I was like, hey, why do we have to be having that? But anyway, I saw this lady on YouTube said, I'm not addicted to anything but Jesus. And I like like that. If you're going to be addicted, be addicted to the Lord. Anyway, my point with all that is simply say this. Listen, your answer in life is not in who you are. Your answer in life is who he is. And he is still alive today. He still wants to help you. He still wants to work in your life. He still wants to love you. And by the way, he is merciful. He is gracious. And when you feel like you can't make it, he is there to help you make it. Yes, life throws at us some things that I don't understand. But as I look at all these 26 miracles of Jesus, there's an underlying theme I find through every single one of them. Two of those, two things are simply this. Number one, the Lord loves people and still does. Number two, he wants you to be well. He wants you to be whole. And I am so thankful even though people that we've known recently have gone on to be with the Lord. You know, one of the beautiful things about a person who dies that knows the Lord, when they die concerning their sickness they're dealing with, they are instantly healed on the other side of that second. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know that a person that does not know the Lord, when they die, they, they go lost into eternity. I don't know if they're still sick, diseased, or whatever, but they're tormented the rest of their life, and then they have to face the great white throne judgment, and then they're thrown into the lake of fire. It's horrible being a person without Jesus. It, when you leave this life, leaving it with the Lord in your heart and your body and your mind, even though you died prematurely, there's still hope because of who we are on the other side, and you're with him. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to comfort you today, regardless of what you're going through, I just want you to know Jesus Christ is our answer he still is and always will be. And I'd just like to pray with you right now. Maybe you're like this woman right now. Maybe you've got an issue you've dealt with for 12 years. Maybe it's not an issue of blood, and maybe it's not 12 years. Maybe it's just 12 days and 12 months. But I want you to know the determination of this woman, and we'll meet her one day, whatever her name is. We'll shake her hand and get to say hello to her. And we'll see, because God stopped the world for a second through his son, and reached out to this woman, and he called her daughter. He called her daughter, and he's calling you today. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for every person here. Right now, for those in the sound of my voice that need encouragement or ministry, I just want to thank you that you are good, and your mercy endures forever. I just want to thank you for mercy over every family here. 
over every husband and wife, every marriage represented, those here, those watching, for every person in their body right now. I pray the healing life of God right now would flow in Jesus' name. I just want to stop just a minute before we dismiss. If there's anything in your body right now, and let's just bow our heads for just a moment. If there's something in your body, no one looking around. But if you have something in your body and you just want to touch that area of your body, maybe it's just, maybe it's just your mind. Maybe it's just thoughts that you're thinking or things that are coming at you that are de- you're dealing with. I just want you to know that the Lord is the comfort, the comfort of your life, the counselor of your life. I want to take just a moment before we dismiss this service, and I know you got things to do. There's a lot on your plate, and you're about to go, as they say, 90 to nothing. I just want you to pause for just a second and hear that inner voice inside of you. Maybe there's a word from God you need to hear. Maybe there's a thing you need to see impressed, an impression on your mind. And I just want you to receive that, that, that or encouragement for the Lord, that, that wisdom. And as you're doing that, and for those that need physical healing, just again, put your hand over your body right over that part, and let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you right now. I just speak to every person's body, and I thank you that we receive healing from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet from those that are watching. I thank you, Lord, for reaching into their very being right now and healing that area any disease, any infirmity, anything, any issue right now, we receive the life of God to flow into that situation. We battle any thoughts of discouragement and any anxiety and worry. And Satan would try to tell us this is not going to happen. You're not going to get this. You're not going to get that. I just want to thank you, Lord Jesus. You're forever faithful. And I thank you for your faithfulness to each person right now who's, who's got their hand over their body that's believing you for something. We receive it right now. We receive it. Let's just say this together. Say, Lord Jesus, all together now, one more time. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you haven't changed, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And right now, I just receive from you, like this woman did, these two men did, I receive from you. I reach out to you by faith, and I receive right now, in your mighty name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. And I'd encourage you today, for those that are watching, maybe you need to take that time where you just go thank the Lord. You say, Pastor, I don't feel anything. There are times I've walked away from a service and didn't feel anything, and later when I went back to my communion table, and I know that I mentioned that many times, but this is just where I am. That is my point of contact. That's my place of contact. And I just take a scripture and I take those precious elements and just a moment of privacy by myself, I give myself to the Lord Jesus and I receive from him. And many times when I've received from him, the answer came, the situation changed and things happened in my life for the better. And I want that to happen for you. And I want you to be able to take that message, not only to your own life, but to others. Hey, we need your help here at Metroflex Family Church as you dismiss the service today. We have, we have new updated invite cards. And listen, our desire here is to see more people here. And you may know some person that in this realm of influence that you have that needs this church family, that needs the love, the messages that come from the platform here, not only in worship and in the Word of God. Again, I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, I made a decision as far as my pulpit ministry and my responsibilities. I'm not here to talk about my opinions. I'm not even here to talk about current events. I'm here just to simply talk about God's Word, the beauty of who Jesus Christ was, and let His life and love and ministry do all the talking. I'm not here to argue or debate. I'm not here to, I mean, I stand for what I believe in, and I stand in who I am. And I'm not going to ignore the issues of life. But listen, there's just so much more to talk about and so much more to cover. And I just want to honor and glorify him. I really do. And I want to bring people to that type of message. And by the way, I'm not, it's not about me and being, you know, my name and famous and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not that and don't desire that. But I desire also for people to have peace with God. And there's a track back there that really captures who Brian Jacobs is. I want you to know the Lord, but I want you to have peace with God. And maybe you know of an employee, maybe you know somebody you work with, maybe you know a family member that has no peace with God. Let this track do the talking. Just simply give them these two pieces of information 
and you be a host to someone, invite them here. You don't have to preach at them. I'll do that. We've got plenty of people that do that. But people need to sometimes be invited. And, you know, because we're not the biggest church yet or have all this, like, whatever, people might feel more comfortable in an atmosphere like this. I don't know. I don't really care as far as... I, I'm not ashamed of who we are as a church family. I wish more people would show up. I know a lot of people are distracted. I know a lot of people have things going on. People make me promises week after week. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there and be there. And they don't show up. What do I do with that? I'm, I'm, I'm faithful. I've never ever stood up here and said, man, I'm not going to speak today if there's not but so many people here. I minister like there's 10,000 people here. You know why? That's just the way I am. That's who I am. I have a pastor the other day said, well, your church is just it seems like it's never going to grow. I said, well, that's really kind of you to say. And I appreciate your encouragement in the Lord. And so you're really a great man to be around. But anyway, that's what I'm saying to myself. I said, but you know what? This was the words that came out of my mouth because I had to step back after, you know, after being insulted, basically. I said, you know what? I'm enjoying where I am. I love the people that are around me. And I'm doing it as unto the Lord. That's all I can say. I said, but there is one difference between you and I. He said, well, what's that? I said, your church is in $3.4 million worth of debt. Mine's not. I sleep a lot better than you at night, don't I? Well, yeah, but I have a good bank and a good loan situation. I said, you may do. And yes, you do have a good bank and good loan, apparently. But I said, I'm not going down that way. Because maybe you're the only pastor I've ever met where a bank and a loan situation didn't bother you. But most of the men that have a bank and loan situation are not doing good. Most of my friends that ever had a bank and loan situation, half of them are not even within the ministry today. And some of them have died. So I wouldn't judge a person by the numbers. I judge the person by the peace of God and what they're trying to do out of sincerity. And that's what we're trying to do here. I just told him, I just, I just, it was so beautiful. I said, I'm not here to compete. I'm here to complete the body of Christ. And that's what we're here to do with others, Lord. Let's love people. And by the way, we don't need anybody from another church. Do you know how many unchurched people are here in Johnson County? I mean, people have never darkened the doors of a church. They need us. They need to be around you. And let's just reach out to them. And by the way, please, you know, forward the services, forward the, an invitation via Facebook, whatever you can do, reach out to someone because sometimes people just simply need to be invited. And Blakely is telling us how she feels about Metroplex Family Church. She's my greatest cheerleader. <laughs> Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much. I pray your best over every person in this room. And as they go forth today dealing with family, friends, and situations, I thank you that the grace of God goes with them mightily. In Jesus' name, amen.